everything, you know, he teaches you and reminds you. And the Shabbat is one of the most important feasts that the Lord established. One of the first ones, he established a time of rest. We enter into rest with our Heavenly Father. The Lord rested from all his works, right? And then on the, uh, and commanded us to rest in his presence as well. And just as a, a reminder, um, it is a time of quiet, a time of putting aside earthly concerns, right? And leaving, leaving them, you know, outside. They, they no longer matter. And I'm saying that because even this afternoon, as Rabbi Gabe and I were, were coming over here, uh, we have to sometimes watch ourselves when we're, when we're talking, we're having conversations or whatever. We were, we were talking about a subject about nutrition and about things like that, and, and it was a subject I'm very passionate about. And then my husband said, you know, honey, um, you know, you're getting too excited here. You, you, you're taking my peace away. So it's like, oh, my goodness, you're right. I'm sorry. It's Shabbat. It's Shabbat. Those things are not important. And so I'm just saying, we need, we need, I do it, we do it. Sometimes we need to even watch our conversation because sometimes as we're, you know, entering into the Shabbat, we can't bring these silly concerns that have nothing to do with the Lord or entering into his rest. We need to leave them outside, leave them outside of our minds, leave them outside. You know, just, just watch our conversation so that, you know, we, sometimes we, we, we get out of work but work doesn't get out of us, <laughs> so we need to leave it behind because we don't want to steal somebody else's peace either. You know, it's about entering into his rest. These things are not important. Entering into his rest, loving one another, loving God, that's what it's all about. So that's why we're here tonight. We've entered into a period of time called the counting of the Omer, and um, our friend T-Square is going to tell us about that. And we have this, the Shabbat table. Of course, we have a little bit of unleavened bread tonight. Candles, bread, wine, all of the things that are reminders about who God is, who we are, and what he expects from each and every one of us. Okay, so here's uh, T-Square, our um, newly appointed uh, interim assistant rabbi. And uh, it's a pleasure. So Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, Robinson. So, uh, as we enter into the Shabbat, we kind of just kind of unplug, leave the loop behind, relax a little bit, and uh, we do the presentation of the table. So, every single week, just like our Jewish brothers and sisters all over the world that have been uh, performing the Shabbat table, um, every single week, we're going to be doing the same thing, but we have an advantage. We have the ability to have the understanding and see through the eyes of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, so it becomes even that much more special. So our first um, prayer that um, we always do every single week is the lighting of the candles. Now, it is known traditionally as the last act of work done before the Shabbat, and usually um, the wife or the woman of the household would come and she would light the candles and um, it became a ceremonial thing. But for us, it is a representation of what is uh, uh, prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 when the prophet Isaiah said that a virgin would conceive by the Holy Spirit and give birth to a son, and she would name him Im Anuel, which the direct translation from Hebrew to English is with us God. Um, but as it, you know, modern age has gone by, we say Emmanuel or God with us. And so... Uh, my beautiful bride is going to come and light the candles. If you would all please stand and join me as we uh, show the first um, part of prophecy in Isaiah that is uh, about the coming of our Messiah. O Kata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidshenu bidvaro, v'natamanu et Yeshua mishikenu, mitzivenu leolad haolam. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe. You have sanctified us by your word, 
even as Yeshua, our Messiah, and command us to be a light to the world. Amen. Amen. And so, like I said, yes, the light of the world uh, coming in through our one Messiah Yeshua declared himself to be the light of the world. And it said, he is the light that lights every man. And so the reason why this is special is because we take all the things that have been practiced by the Jewish people for thousands of years. And now the culmination when it was being practiced and represented by the greatest Jew in history, which was our Messiah Yeshua or Jesus, as you would call him in English. So now the next um, set of prayers. The first one is on um, the blessing over the bread. Now we are in the culmination of uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was initiated in Pesach, which um, our Jewish brothers and sisters were liberated uh, from Egypt by the Lord, by a mighty hand uh, thousands of years ago. And then they were brought into the wilderness. And he started the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And as if you were here last week for the service, and if you read the Torah portion, you understand the significance of removing leaven from our diets throughout the week. It is also a spiritual representation of removing the sin from our lives because we are called to be just like Messiah Yeshua, and he was blameless. And so that means eventually the Lord also wants us to be blameless. And so um, the night of Passover, he broke um, what was a piece of matzah, like I said, because it was the initiation the Feast of the Leavened Bread. And if you have a big enough piece, you can look in the light, and there's tiny little holes in it. And if you have a large enough piece, there's also brown stripes going through it. Now, this is a representation. He said, this is my body broken for you. And so what it was was a, a physical example of what he had to endure on our behalf. And so every single week when I recite this prayer, I try to remember what it is exactly that our Messiah Yeshua went through on my behalf. He took the lashings from me. He was hung on a cross from me. He took the beatings from me. The things that I know that I couldn't do because the Lord requires a blood sacrifice from the beginning of time, even before the tabernacle in the wilderness in Genesis, when Adam and Eve sinned and they hid from the Lord to cover their shame and their nakedness. It says that he had to slay an animal because there has been a requirement of blood for sin from the beginning of time. And so as we recite this prayer every week, we are already trying to tune in in our hearts the requirement of the blood sacrifice and thanking and remembering Messiah Yeshua for what he did on our behalf. So if you would please join me in that prayer. Amen. Now in English, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who issues forth bread from the earth. Amen. And let us never forget that Yeshua, our Messiah, is the true bread from heaven that a man may eat thereof and never taste death. Please partake in his body. The next blessing that we do is the blessing over the yain or over the wine. And again, this is another uh, physical representation of what Messiah Yeshua did for us. This is a representation of his blood spilt on our behalf. And again, like I said, with the establishment of the tabernacle in the wilderness, the Lord gave the Levitical priesthood a way, a sacrificial system that every single time you sin, you would be able to purge your consciousness of those sins. And it says in the word that the sacrifice roofs were going all day long. That means people were constantly having to, you know, ask the Lord for forgiveness. And so because we are flawed, not he is flawed, he had to create a new covenant for us, one that would give us the ultimate purge of conscience. And so he sent his son, Messiah Yeshua, down on our behalf, like many of us have read before in John chapter 3, verse 16, that uh, he sent his only begotten son for our salvation. And so every single week when I recite this prayer, I remind myself that I am not perfect yet. And I can only attain perfection by the Ruach HaKodesh. I can't do it by my own works. I can't do it by my own strength. And we are going to stumble. We are going to fall 
along the way in each of our walks. We all have our different backgrounds, our different traumas, our different experiences. But what we can do is take advantage of it is a power, it is a freedom that the Lord has given us to be able to ask him for forgiveness. He says we are able to boldly approach the throne of grace. We no longer have to do what the first son and daughter did, Adam and Eve. We no longer have to hide. Whenever you fall, the Lord is ready right there to help you pick back up. And so we ask you, Lord, to forgive us of our sins and remind us of what you have done for us. Please join me in this prayer. Bauchet Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei pri hagafen Amen Now in English Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. As King David said, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see. The Lord is good, say amen. Now, again, like I said, what you if you have come from a church background, you would know this to be as communion, what we just presented. It is very important. The Lord, like you've heard Rabbi Gabe say many times, he's a very specific God, and he wants to speak specifically into our lives. And so we're able to observe, you know, his patterns and the way he orders things. The reason why, you know, it really blessed me, we have a brother here that carried the Torah uh, several weeks ago where he said that the places that he had previously been, they only do the communion or talk about our, the Messiah once a, you know, maybe every few months or maybe even once a year. And it saddened me and it brought me joy at the same time because that was a, one of the first things that ministered to him is that we as a congregation, the Lord has commanded us to present this table every single week. And uh, it's a powerful tool because now we go on to the Shema. What you've heard Rabbi Gabe say before is this table is everything that the Lord did for us on our behalf. It is nothing we did. Our only responsibility was accept him into our hearts and say yes. But this was his gift to the world, once and for all, proving his perfect love for us. And unfortunately, uh, in this day and age, the church teaches that it ends there that Jesus did it for you, that you don't have to do anything because he did it for you. And unfortunately, there is nothing in the word of God that gives that uh, any evidence towards that. And so we know that Messiah, out of his own mouth, before he ascended into heaven, he told his disciples, greater works than these shall you do. So that means after Messiah, there was a continuance of faith. In Matthew 5, um, verses 17, he says that he did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill and the, the Hebrew word for fulfillment is lechayem, which the literal translation into English is to establish. So he came to establish and show us the way to walk in faith so that after he was gone, we could continue to walk in faith. And we present this table at the beginning of our service every single week because we want to invite you to really enjoy the Shabbat. That is why we're all here. This was the first feast mandated by the Lord. And to truly enjoy the Shabbat, to be able to plug in, to remove yourself from this world and to experience the peace and, and uh, take advantage of practicing your establishing relationships with him, you do have to have him in your heart. You do have to have accepted him as your savior. And so we want you to have that opportunity before the service even starts, before we get into the worship, before we get into the word so that you could truly understand what it is that we're trying to achieve here. So now we go on to the Shema. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40, one of the lawyers at that time, a practitioner of the Torah, asked him, saying, Master, Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he quoted what is, can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, which says, Shema Israel, or hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Echad, one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might was in the first covenant. That means everything you had, every fiber in your being, you had to give to the Lord. And Yeshua made a very perfect adjustment to that, which was mind. The reason why is now, once you've been indwelt with the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God is within you. And so all the battles that we go through on a daily basis, as we face the adversary, as we face our enemies, is all up here. Everything is inside now. 
So the Lord has called every fiber of our being, heart, mind, soul, and strength. If you're interested in hearing his voice and being blessed, restored, healed, and then to be used by him to bring power and love into this world, you have to be doing this commandment right here. From the moment that Messiah Yeshua's eyes opened to the moment he went to sleep, he was in communion with his Father, and he has called us to abide just like he does. So if you're interested in that, please join me in the prayer. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevot Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed Now in English, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you, Lord, for being here. I feel him. You feel him too, right? Amazing. So now again, another set of prayers. And if you're like myself, you might be saying, oh my God, there's too many prayers. But at that time, I did not realize the significance of these prayers, the reason why we say these prayers. And this first prayer is the Kiddush prayer, honoring the God of our creation. And what the Lord put on my heart is in Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, Moses is uh, again reading the commandments to the children of Israel. And in verses 14 and 15, not, the Lord commands us to keep the Shabbat in verse 14. And then if my wife, if you could please put up uh, verse... Oh, this is the counting of the Omer. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Thank you. That's why I'm in term. I still got plenty to learn. <laughs> so this is the counting of the Omer. So backtrack. Uh, the Lord commanded us uh, to do the counting of the Omer. And so the counting of the Omer is when the Feast of Unleavened Bread is established, you were supposed to count seven Sabbaths plus one day, okay, until... Um, uh, until uh, the, the Shavuot, the Feast of First Fruits. And so the reason why uh, we, we do the counting of the Omer is the buildup until the harvest. Every single week reminding us that we are propelling forward after our salvation from Egypt, after the Passover, after trying to purge leaven from our homes. Then comes the first harvest when we start walking with the Lord and we start bearing fruits just like he asked us to. And so with that in mind, Please join me in that prayer. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kedishanu bivitzvotav vetzivanu al sefirat haomer. In English, blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the counting of the owner. Today is seven days of the Omer. May the merciful one restore unto us the service of the Bet Hamikdash to its place speedily and in our days. Amen. Okay. Now, we have the, the Kiddush prayer and the Refua. And so, yes, this Kiddush prayer. Now, if my wife would please put up uh, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 15. Go ahead and uh, give that a read. Okay, and remember now, verse 14, he is commanding us to keep the Shabbat, which what we're doing, the, the table, everything that we presented. And now verse 15, it says, And remember that thou wast a servant in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord thy God brought thee out thee hence through a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord thy God commanded thee to keep the Sabbath day or the Shabbat. So not only is the Lord commanding us to rest, but he is also commanding us to remember where he's taken us from. Every single week, because as human beings, myself included, we have a short memory, very short memory. You know, we can get in our pride very fast and we can think that we've gotten to a certain point and we can think, you know, that the Lord hasn't done many things in our life perhaps. But every single week, he is commanding us to remember that we were once slaves in Egypt. And so we say, thank you, Lord, for uh, liberating us from our past. So my wife, if you could please put up the prayer. Um, so 
That's the first prayer. And then the second prayer is the Rafua, which is the prayer of healing. Okay. And that prayer for myself and my personal experience has been one of the most powerful prayers um, because I came into the body of Christ very sick. I was a very sick individual physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. I was very lost. But most of my healings, what the Lord had to do was show me that I had unforgiveness in my heart. They are layers of trauma, all of our experiences in life. And so as you give those things over to the Lord is as he can show you um, what you need. So if right now in your life you're feeling you're at a blockage or you've hit a wall or you feel like you haven't really experienced that much of the Lord, I invite you, I challenge you to ask the Lord, say, Lord, show me my heart. Show me the deepest, darkest parts of my heart that have nothing to do with you so that I can bring them to your attention. And then you can forgive or ask him for forgiveness. Revitz. Just incidentally, for those of you who are not of Jewish background and, uh, and, and um, perhaps are just now getting acquainted with this time called the counting of the Omer, which happens after Passover, um, you may want to think of it this way, that it's actually the countdown to Pentecost. So Rabbi Gabe, I'm sure, will be expounding on that in the coming, the coming days. But uh, they happen simultaneously. So um, be prepared to be blessed. Again, the house of God is no longer divided. So... Everybody's going to be blessed. We're all going to learn so much. And we praise and we thank our God. Um, this blessing is about praising him and thanking him, the ruler of the universe, because after all, it revolves around him. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotah v'ratzavanu, v'shabad kodsho b'ahav v'ratzon hinkilanu, zikalo l'maaseh v'rashit, ki hu yom tehila b'kradesh, zikal yatze mitzrayim. Kibanu Bahartav Vyotanu Kidash Tami Kola Amin, Veshabat Gotsheha, Vehavo Vraton Him Khatanu, Baruchata Donai Mekadesha Shabbat. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and wanted us to be his own. And with love and favor he gave us his holy Sabbath as a heritage, a remembrance of creation. For that day is the prologue to the holy convocation, a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. For us did you choose, and us did you sanctify from all the nations. And your holy Sabbath, with love and favor, did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctifies the Sabbath. Amen. And of course, as um, Assistant Rabbi T. Square said, um, the prayer of healing, because the Lord is a God who even to this day continues to heal those who seek him with a contrite and a repentant heart. Rafainu Adonai v'ne Rafe, hoshienu v'ne Vashia. Heal us, O Lord, and we shall be healed. Save us, and we shall be saved. Kitehilatenu ata, for you are our praise. Ve'ale refu ashlem alechol makotenu, and bring complete recovery for our ailments. Yehi chatzon milfanecha Adonai Elohei, velohei avotei. May it be your will, O Lord my God, and the God of my forefathers. That you quickly send a complete recovery from heaven, spiritual healing and physical healing. For you are God, King, the faithful and compassionate healer. Blessed are you, O Lord, who heals the sick of his people, Israel. And so now as we put away, put aside our earthly or worldly concerns and uh, have let them go and are standing in the presence of our God and King, fully ready to enter into his Shabbat, enter into his presence with praise and thanksgiving, we're going to listen to the sound of the shofar, this, this sound that is always a very vivid reminder of who God is and who we are and what he expects from each and every one of us the reminder that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he is God. He is the ruler of the universe and that the Shabbat is all about him and that he commands us to rest in his presence 
and that it is a privilege to be able to fellowship with our God and fellowship with one another and understand that the Shabbat is all about rest and fellowship and a reminder that without the Messiah, without a relationship with the living God, there is no rest, there is no peace, there is no Shabbat Shalom as we listen to the call to worship and the call to peace. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who separates the holy from the profane. Blessed art thou, o Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us a day of rest, a Shabbat, a special day, a sanctified day, made holy because it is in your presence. Blessed art thou, o Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sent the Messiah to teach us, to teach us how to walk in righteousness, to change our lives, and to help us to understand that righteousness begins in the heart. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who will send the Messiah again very, very soon to take his place on the throne of David in Jerusalem and at long last bringing the will of God as it is in heaven here on earth and at long last bringing peace on earth and goodwill to all men. As we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise, we remember the words of the Lord, what he said to Moses. He said, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, truly, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall be put to death, for whosoever does any work, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh it is a Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord, wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. We praise you, we thank you, Lord, as we enter into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise on this Shabbat, on your Shabbat.
As we uh, come to almost the end of this, this Passover week, many of us really uh, getting a, a real sense of how the Lord has delivered us from our own sins and how he saved us from ourselves. And so as a result of that, many of us uh, come away with a, a new song in our hearts. We sing a new song, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And we praise our, our Heavenly Father for giving a new song in our heart, a song of hope, a living hope in our hearts, our minds, and our souls. The psalmist says, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation, his Yeshua, from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all the people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. We praise you and we thank you, Lord. <laughs>
So Passover, Passover week, the week of, of, of eliminating leaven from our, our homes and our hearts. Um, we are left with a new inspiration. We begin the year um, with a new song in our hearts and a new hope and a new understanding. We are inspired. And surely this is what the Apostle Peter was thinking when he said, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, you also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by our Messiah, Messiah Yeshua.
know, God himself said at Passover, the first night of Passover, he said that this would be for us the beginning of months. So he established that, um, that this would be the beginning of a new year, a new life for each and every one of us. And those of us who have been delivered from our own lives <laughs> and, our own, and our own mistakes, our own sins, we can certainly relate to that. So um, just a prayer for this, this time, a, pair, a prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, Adonai, for giving us another year of life. Thank you for bringing us safely to this season, Shehekiyanu. Thank you for all the experience of this past year, for times of success, which will always be happy memories, for times of failure, which reminds us of our own weaknesses and of our need for you, for times of joy when the sun was shining, and for the times of sadness which drove us to you. Forgive us for the hours that we wasted, for the chances that we failed to take, for the opportunities we missed this past year. Help us in the time ahead, the days ahead, to make this next year the best year yet, and through it all, to be a light to the world and to bring glory, honor, and joy to you, Lord. Amen.
turn to someone now, wish somebody a Shabbat Shalom and help somebody feel really welcome and maybe share a smile, a word of encouragement. Sometimes just a smile is enough.
Good to praise the Lord, right? Thank you, honey. Thank you, dancers. And it's nice to be in the house of the Lord. Anybody happy to be here besides myself? Hallelujah. April. Time flies when you're having a good time. But anyway... As we continue lifting up Messiah Yeshua, because when he is lifted up, he will draw everyone to himself. That's what this place is about. It's not about, it's not about religion. It's about relationship, because God so loved the world, he gave a theologian. No, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So what does our God want? If he is the way, the truth, and the life, our Father in heaven wants father-son, father-daughter relationship. Once you understand that, you will run away from religion like you would run away from a rattlesnake. Religion is diametrically opposed to an intimate relationship with God because father and son relationship is a special relationship. Only my brother and my sister and myself were allowed to call my father dad or papi in Spanish. Everyone else had to say Leon. And some people even had to say Mr. Leon. So if you're sitting there going, Jehovah, you don't understand the kind of relationship that he wants. Our father who is in heaven. In Hebrew, the word is Abba, our father, our Abba who is in heaven, of course his name is holy, and that his will would be done here on earth as it is in heaven. How many know that, that he wants this kind of intimate relationship with every person? And once you understand that, your religious behavior should go out the window because that doesn't work. Religiosity, self-righteousness does not work. The only thing that works is intimacy with our God. And what do I preach on all the time? Love God or die. That's the choice. You don't want to love God? Fine. Uh, I'll miss you. I'm going to miss you very much. But if you do love God, you'll probably make it. Even with faults. Not that we preach fault. Paul said we're under grace. Much of the grace preachers, that's a disgrace too, telling people you can sin when you're under grace or you can do whatever you want to. I mean, that's, that's a fallacy. That's, a, that's the doctrine from the pit of hell. Paul said, Rabbi Paul, Rabbi Shaul said, because we're under grace, should we sin? And he said, God forbid. And we know biblically sin is the transgression of God's commandments. Is it a right to get saved? Is it a right to be under grace? And is it all right for God to tell you still what to do? I think he knows a little bit better than we do. I mean, you're, you're, you can continue uh, running your own life if you want to, but he wants to lead your life. He wants to lead my life. As, as, as King David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not 
get in the way. I shall not want. And then Psalm 23 says, he leads me. Unfortunately, most Jewish funerals, that's the psalm that is read once the person is dead, which doesn't count anymore. You were never led by God. He was never your shepherd. And unfortunately, most believers are not that way. And he wants to communicate with us. Uh, Yeshua said, my sheep hear my smoke signals, taps on your head, Morse code, Cloud formation, rain on your head. He didn't say that. He said, my sheep hear my voice. You know what the Holy Spirit told me a long time ago? Everybody's real good at hearing the devil. You can hear the devil, right, when he says kill yourself or go kill somebody else or go lie to somebody or go cheat. That's the devil talking. You can hear him pretty good, right? So how come you can't hear God? Only, I, I remember a, a person telling me, only the devil speaks to you. And I said, yeah, God has tape on his mouth. God can't speak anymore. He can only speak from what is written. How many know this is known as the logos, and what you hear in your ear is called the rhema word? In other words, it says to marry, but it doesn't say who to marry. It's nice to hear from the Holy Spirit who you're supposed to marry. I knew I was supposed to marry when my first wife, who was Jewish, thought that believing in Jesus was crazy. Well, at 30 years later, I'm still crazy, and she still doesn't believe in Jesus. But the Lord said, marry this woman. And we've been married almost 25 years. You know something? He knows how to choose. Excellent. And our marriage has gotten progressively better. Not like Hollywood, you start out hot and then you get cold. No, with the Lord, you may start out cold, but then you get hot. Because the Lord, the word says you, we go from glory to glory. We go from good to better to best. When you have a relationship with God, everything's supposed to work. Shalom doesn't mean just peace. Shalom means nothing broken and nothing missing. Because when you're broken and you're missing things, you ain't got no shalom. And somebody, and somebody say, God wants to fix, God wants to repair, God wants to restore, and God wants to light us up and show us off to everyone else who doesn't have a relationship with God, amen, who hates to live, who hates to wake up, who hates to, to, to even live anymore. And most of us have been there. I'm not, I, I'm, I'm talking to myself here. I mean, God, Yeshua said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly, and it's not about the money. I mean, you could have a bunch of money and be miserable. I have met so many miserable millionaires. I was one of them, so you're looking at one. Ex-millionaire. When somebody came into my office and said, God told me to tell you, you're not going to find happiness in the things of this world. How does this man, who I've never spoken to about personal items or personal things, how did this man know that I was a miserable millionaire? I never told him that. You don't tell people you're miserable when you're rich. You tell them, ha ha, I got it. You don't. And you wish you were in my shoes. I never told him I wasn't happy. And he told me the secrets of my heart. Only God could have spoken to him to tell me something personal like that. That's the best kind of evangelism, by the way. Evangelism is not some formula. Evangelism, you hear God and you tell the person whatever God is telling you to tell them. That's spirit-led evangelism. Because when you're led of the spirit, then you're cooking with gas. When you can hear the voice of the Lord, then he could use you. Amen? And he knows us by name, the Bible says. He called, who did he call? He said, what's your name, Moses? He knew his name. Moses said, who are you? And he said, I am. What kind of name is that? You're Moses, I know your name, and you don't even know who I am. I mean, no, most people don't know God, but God knows every single one of us. Even the hairs on your head are numbered. A bird doesn't fall to the ground that he's a, he doesn't know. Our God cares very much and is personal with anyone who is wishing to be personal. But like most of us, including dear old Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived before Yeshua, 
No greater prophet than Yeshua, who didn't even know who God was, didn't even know God existed. But Moses got to know God. He went from a stutterer, from a nervous old Jewish guy, to being powerful in God because he knew his God. He knew who, who God was and who God is and what God can do. Most of us are still shaking in our boots and stuttering, not even realizing who our God is, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I'm here to tell you, he's still in the miracle business. I guess a lot of people don't understand that because if they knew that God was still in the miracle business, we'd have a bunch of sick people here breaking the door down to come in to get a miracle because the God of miracles is here. But there's so many people practicing religion out there, people don't want it anymore. They think we're in here playing religion. And they don't want religion. I don't blame them. I don't want religion either. When you're in trouble, religion's not going to help you. When you're sick, religion's not going to help you. Sometimes even doctors can't help you. Sometimes even money can't solve your problems. You need God. And you need the real God. You need the active God. You need the God that does stuff. And when does God do things? When you ask him. When does God reveal himself? When you do what he says. When does the devil reveal himself in your life? When you do what the devil says. Then you have the devil in your house. Then the devil manifests. It's a pretty simple concept. You do what God says, you see God. You do what the devil says, you see the devil. So if you like the devil over your house, who the Lord said he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, have him over for coffee. He's banned from our house. He is not invited. We don't want him. We reject him on a continuous basis. But he doesn't give up so easy. Have you noticed that? He insists. He's like a, he's like a, 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 a pesky salesman. He's a pushy salesman. He wants us not to do what God says. That's his claim to fame. Because when you do what God says, the Bible says he makes war. Revelation 12, 17. One of my favorite scriptures. Look who the devil makes war with. The people that don't do what God says. Who does the devil make war with? The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with who? The non-believers, the naysayers, the atheist, the religious people. Who does the devil make war with? Who does he pick on? He makes war with the remnant of her seed. The seed, the remnant of her seed in Revelation 12, the woman is represented by Israel. The remnant of her seed, which keep tradition. I mean, oh, when you do traditional things, there's nice Christian tradition, there's nice Jewish tradition, devil don't care. He's got you. You're already roadkill. Because tradition is not going to help you. The commandments of God will help you. So he makes war with those that do what? Keep the commandments of God and Have the testimony of Yeshua. I would venture to say, without being too biblically crazy, that if you're a remnant of Israel and you keep the Torah and you have the testimony of Yeshua HaMashiach, known in the English-speaking world as Jesus, the Christ, Christ is not his last name, the Christ, the Hebrew word for Christ is Messiah, Mashiach, anointed one. So those that keep the commandments of God and keep the Torah and have the testimony of Yeshua. I think Messianic believers do that. Oh, brother, we worship on Sunday. Oh, brother, it's Good Friday. Oh, brother, it's Easter Sunday coming up. What are you guys doing? We did this last week. We're a week apart. Something's fishy here. We'll have to explain. 
You'll have to explain, why was Passover last week and Easter is this week? Uh Uh-huh, we're going to have to look in the Bible. We're going to have to read some scripture. Because that's how they keep us dumb. They don't want us to read the Bible. No, no, no. You need a rabbi to understand the Torah. You need the Pope. You need the Father. You need the Son. You need the priest. Only they can interpret scripture for you. Yeah, so they can tell you what they think and what they believe. Can I read it for myself? And we're going to put it up on the screen. And you're going to see it in black and white. Blue and white. Like a blue tone. I remember when I first read the Bible, the entire Bible, I read the Jewish part and the Gentile part. I thought to myself, where do these people get this stuff from? It's not in the Bible. I'm like, did I get all the pages? Do I have the right translation? You know, they have programs now. You get 30 translations. They basically all say the same thing. Scary, though, when they add to the word, because it says not to do that. Somewhere in the Bible it says don't add and don't subtract. So let's pray. Let's ask God what the heck is going on here. We're confused. We don't know which way to go, Lord. Shall we go to the Jewish Jesus or shall we go to the Roman Jesus? We need to, well, the real Jesus, please stand up. So let's read a psalm from King David. Let's get warmed up. I'm glad we're all here. It's Good Friday. You know what's so good about it? I got the day off. I don't know. I hear in my spirit Psalm 32. Psalm 32. King David. Now, did King David, did you notice King David, the psalms, it was a man after God's own heart, who had a personal relationship with God. I mean, when you read the Psalms, that is not religion. That is somebody who loved God and thought God was real and addressed him as a real God, talked to him like he was real, talked to him like he could hear him. I don't know if God hears us. Oh, God hears us, every word. He he said he doesn't like uh, repetitive praying. What does that mean? He can hear you the first time. We're the ones that can't hear him. Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputes not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silent, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said... I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when you may be found. Surely in the floods of great waters they shall not come near unto him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall compass me about with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you shall go. I will guide you with my eye. Be not as the horse or as the mule which have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle, lest they come near to you. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusts in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. Amen, amen. Beautiful psalm. Oh, they're all beautiful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Abba, we praise you. We thank you here tonight. Your word declares that where two or three are gathered in your name, Matthew 18 and 20, and we are gathered in the name above every name, the name Yeshua. The great I am is our salvation. Yeshua in Hebrew, salvation. We are gathered in your name, Father. And because we do that, you said you are in our midst. Thank you, Lord. We welcome you. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Your words are welcome here. Your truth is welcome here. Your way is 
welcome here. Your life is welcome here. Father God, teach us, every single one of us, Jewish people and non-Jewish people, your way, your truth, your life, and show us this abundant road. Show us our transgression. Show us where we're wrong. Show us where we have moved away from you, Lord. Bring us close to you. We need you, Father, in heaven. Your word declares that without you we can do nothing. Teach us to do nothing without you anymore, to do everything with you and in you. Teach us to walk in your presence, in the Spirit. Teach us to be led by your Holy Spirit. Teach us to hear your words, Lord. Write your instructions as you say in this Brit Kadashah, in this new covenant. Write them in our hearts. Write them in our inward parts. We bring to you tonight our inward parts, our minds, our hearts, our souls. We love you, Father, in the first and great commandment according to your word with all of our hearts, with all of our souls, with all of our strength, with all of our minds here tonight. We are focused on you, Lord, here tonight because your word declares that if our eye is single upon you, we, our bodies, our spirits will be filled with your light. And Father God, we need your light. We need you, Father in heaven, to invade every bit of darkness in our life, every bit of ignorance. And we need you to show us how to have the adversary, the one who wants to kill us, the one who wants to destroy our lives, to have him under our foot, Lord, as you promised that you've given us power over all the power of the enemy, to tread on them as scorpions and serpents. And your word declares that nothing by any means shall hurt us. Father God, there are some who are hurting here tonight because they don't know you, they don't know your way, they don't know your truth, and they don't know your life. Father God, teach us your way, your truth, and your life, so that this, all this can be restored. All the hurts, all the pains, all the sorrow, all the suffering can be reversed in our lives. Lord, heal us, restore us, restore our minds, restore our spirits, restore our souls, restore our bodies. In the name of Yeshua, we thank you, Father, that we're able to gather still in this country in your name to practice and worship in spirit and truth. Father God, continue to, to um, protect this house, your house, in the name of Yeshua. We thank you for everything you've done here. We thank you for what you've done in our lives. As your word declares that all things work together for the good because we love you and because you've called us for your purpose. Father God, thank you for your purpose to conform each and every one of us into the image of your Son, our Messiah, our Savior, our King, our Lord. In his name we pray tonight, the name Yeshua, HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray, and the people of God said, Amen, Amen, Amen. See, the problem is if you don't get things uh, accurately, I mean, error is very costly. That's why the adversary, all he has to do is just change the message just a little bit. It doesn't require much because we learned from Passover last week that a little leaven, a little error, leavens or, or distorts the whole lump or the whole message. The gospel is a specific message. The Lord walked the things out specifically. The Lord got everything right. The Bible says he's the king of righteousness. We're the kings of wrong. That's why we're required to repent. God doesn't need to repent about anything. He's holy. He's perfect. He doesn't make mistakes, even though you thought that when he created you and I. He didn't make a mistake. The mistake is ours, that we don't listen to him, that we don't do things his way, that we want to tell God what to do. I think that's the faith movement today. I see these people telling God what to do in Jesus' name. I'm like, are you crazy? You know better than God? Or these grace preachers, oh, you don't have to do anything. Christ did it for you. Baloney. If he's the way, the truth, and the life, and he wants us to do things his way, we're to learn. We're good at making messes of our lives. My life at 36 years old was a mess. And I had freedom to do whatever I wanted. I made my choices. I remember a preacher, I was sitting there, and he said, your life 
Where you are right now is the sum total of all the choices you've made. In other words, you're responsible for, I'm, can I just blame my mother or my father or junior? It's your fault, man. If it wasn't for you, I would have been in a much better place. He made me do it. She made me do it. No, you did it. You decided. You made choices. And we make lousy choices. By ourselves, we make lousy choices. With God, we can make different choices. Imagine if you had a real relationship with God and you could hear his choices in your life as opposed to your choices. I heard you say something, T, tonight that you said, I can't do it on my own strength. Well, the first and great commandment is that you love him with all of your strength. In other words, your strength given to him or Seeking him with all your strength will get you real good guidance. The Bible, doesn't the Bible say those who are led of the Spirit? Led of the Spirit doesn't mean you tell God what to do in Jesus' name. That's, what do they call that, blab it and grab it? Name it and claim it? I was taught that for a while. Because they're either name it and claim it, your grace, he did everything, you don't have to do anything. Where are you going? Nowhere. I mean, if we get it accurate, and why are the Jewish people off with the, with the non-Jewish people? The Jewish people are celebrating Passover as of last week. We started Friday. We got to jump on the thing. Oh, I, got, I got a little heat over that. You started a day early and people got confused. You started on the 13th of Nisan. It's the 14th of Nisan. I'm like, you people are really paying attention? And I said, and we might even finish the seven days of unleavened bread tonight. Oh, my God. Shoot me. I'm going to thank God I'm under grace, right? That should be my biggest problem, that we did Passover one day early. I mean, Passover on the Hebrew calendar, which starts on the 14th of Nisan, officially should have started last Saturday night. So that means we would have had a service on Friday night, one Saturday morning, and that means Saturday night. That's three services in a row. I'll be 67 this year. Mercy. <laughs> He's a merciful God. He actually said to me, I could start, I could do Friday night. And we celebrated Passover last week, but now it's Good Friday which is supposed to be when Jesus would be betrayed in the church. But didn't Jesus say that he would be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights? How do you get three days and three nights from Friday night to Sunday morning? Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. He rose on Monday. No, Easter Sunday is Sunday. I don't know. Maybe people didn't have a calculator back then, couldn't count up to three. He probably, 14th of Nisan and the Hebrew calendar was probably on a Thursday night if he rose on Sunday. But he didn't really rise on Sunday because on Sunday the tomb was empty. And Sunday morning when they went there, there was like nobody home. Matthew 28. Oh, it's dangerous when you read the Bible for yourself. Notice what it says here, chapter 28, Matthew verse 1. In the end of the Shabbat, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, the first day of the week in the Hebrew calendar is not Monday. That's the Roman calendar. Yom Rishon, known as the first day of the week, is Sunday. So it says it was the first day of the week. Then came Mary Magdalene, the other Mary, to see where he was buried, the sepulcher, right? And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Fear not, for, you, for I know that you seek Jesus, or Yeshua, which was crucified. Verse 6 says, He is not here. For he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. In other words, he was there. But on Sunday morning, he was gonzo. He was gone. 
he might have rose from the dead on Shabbat. Oh. He finished. It said it was like at the end of the, he maybe he rose on Saturday night on the Roman calendar, but on the Hebrew calendar, Saturday night was the beginning of Sunday. It was the end of Shabbat. So he probably rose, according to the Bible, at the end of Shabbat. Which, you don't get three days and three nights from Friday night. But I mean, we could argue about what day that he actually died. But the main thing is that he rose from the dead. In other words, you can get caught up in the minors and miss the big picture. We're going to argue about when did he actually die. Yes, he shed his blood. Awesome. That's what forgives us. But the main thing is that he rose from the dead. You know why that's so big? Because everybody in this room is going to die. I think if you're, you're destined to die, you would want to know somebody who rose from the dead. Because you're going to die. Do I need a Bible to teach me that? No, you just need to go to a funeral. Because everyone has a predetermined destination of physical death. That's a scary thought. So we don't, let's not talk about it. Maybe it won't happen. Maybe if we don't think about it. I'm not going to think about dying. I'm not going to think about it. I died. I'll deny it. I'm a death denier. That's why Yeshua said, you might as well pick up your cross now and declare yourself physically dead and follow me because I'm going to show you a spiritual road. If you're interested, if you would like to experience spiritual life before you die. You mean you can, I can experience spiritual life before I die? Yeah, that's what he said. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. If you're born of the Spirit and you listen to Him, you will enjoy spiritual life. You know what's so good about spiritual life? You won't taste death. You won't taste spiritual death. Because what most people don't realize is that we're tasting physical death and we're tasting spiritual death. Death is completely normal. <laughs> we're all dying. <laughs> I'm going to die, you're going to die. I remember when I was a kid, I'm going to die? What kind of place is this? I just got started. Is this somebody's idea of a joke? And then my father, a Jewish atheist, said, there's no God. We're in trouble. There's no God. I don't know where I come from. I don't know what I'm doing here, and we're all going to die. Oh, God. Oh, I don't believe in God. Oh, hell. I don't believe in hell either. Dang. This stinks. What kind of place is this? That's why Yeshua said, I'm the door. I'm the escape hatch. I'm your way out of this mess. And we want to listen to everybody else but him. And he did something amazing. He showed life after death. Because people say there's no such thing. Well, oh, I don't believe the Bible. Yes, in 1 Corinthians, he showed himself to 500 Jewish people that he was alive. Could 500 Jews lie? Maybe. Could 500 Catholics lie? Maybe. Well, how do you know he rose from the dead? People say. And you have, to be, you have to answer truthfully. Were you there? Well, he died and rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. I wasn't there. So how do you know he rose from the dead, they'll say to you. Well, if you're born again, if you have the Holy Spirit, if you have spiritual life, you'll understand all about the resurrection of the dead because you have the power of the resurrection 
living inside of you. In other words, no one has to convince you you're going to rise from the dead because you're not dead. You're not spiritually dead anymore. Oh, my God, this is so good. Romans 8. I'm talking to a bunch of dead people. And I'm, going to, I'm telling you, if you live this way, you may physically die. You will physically die. But you won't spiritually die. And we might as well face it. Physical death is a foregone conclusion. Can you do anything about it? Oh, I eat healthy. You take vitamins. I eat macrobiotics. So you'll get a few more miles out of this banana peel, earth suit. You get a few more miles. You'll, you'll prolong the foregone conclusion. But, I mean, get real. If you eat McDonald's or you eat veggie burgers, uh, so you might live, well, so, so, so what's the, what's the uh, you know, I know people that eat you know, McDonald's and smoke cigarettes and outlive those vegetarians, you know? I mean, that's no guarantee, right? You may get a few more miles out of it, but 70, 80, 90, 100? How many hundred-year-olds do you know? Not too many, right? They don't even know they're a hundred by the time they're a hundred. <laughs> I mean, I know a lady, she's 98. I started doing business with her 40 years ago. She doesn't even know who she is anymore. Thank God she doesn't owe me any money. <laughs> she can't remember. So is it a foregone conclusion we're going to physically die? Sooner or later. Like my grandmother used to say, old people have, you know, young people may die, but old people have to die. True? And when my daughters get worried, I say, don't worry, I'm not going to die young. Look, I'm 66 plus. So, so what's the foregone conclusion? If I can't avoid physical death, I might as well follow somebody who beat death because that's the big deal. The big deal is he rose from the dead and then he showed himself. And of course, Peter said, I am not going to believe it till I see him. And then when he shows up and, and shows Peter, he says, here, touch my, the wounds in my arms, touch my side. He, puts, he touches them. He goes, my Lord and my God. Wow. But he is known as the first fruits from the dead. You know, there's a, a Jewish feast in the middle of Passover called First Fruits. Well, you know that, Tessa, because you've been around. There's some people here. First fruits? What is that? Our church didn't teach us that. Because we know from Scripture that the Jewish believers in Yeshua split away from the non Jewish. Uh, believers of Jesus. This happened in the first century. We see it in the Bible. When you look at Acts 15, it, in Acts 15, it actually when they had a meeting after the Lord's death, when Gentiles started getting saved in the Holy Spirit, they had a meeting. Some said they got to, these, these Gentiles need to be circumcised. They were like, no. We don't need that. I mean, who needs that? That's why they do it at eight days old. You don't have a choice. Can you imagine telling a, a 30-year-old Gentile, you got to be circumcised? I mean, I wouldn't believe in Jesus if they told me that. But anyway, there, there's, there was a split up. There was a definite split up at the beginning of the church age. You can't blame the Catholics for this. Go with me to Acts 15 so we can figure out the real Jesus of the Bible. Uh, Acts 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren, it said, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses or the Torah, you cannot be saved. Now, is that true or not? 
if you're not circumcised physically, you can't be saved? So we say, no, we don't believe that. You need to be born again of the Spirit. Nothing to do with the physical, yay or nay. So there was already some people that were saying stuff that wasn't true. How many know that free will can get you in a lot of trouble? It, what does it say in the Bible? Uh, uh, lean not upon your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge God and he will direct your path. Because when you start thinking about your own stuff, nothing makes sense. And you make up things. How I many of you don't have to make anything up? So when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, it was a big argument, according to verse 2. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. This is why it's known as the Jerusalem Council, because they had a question. Some were saying you needed to be circumcised according to the Torah, according to the Moses, to be saved. And verse 3 says, And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phenis and Samaria, declaring, what were they declaring? The conversion of the Gentiles. And they, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. Gentiles getting saved in the first century was a big deal. It's not a big deal now because they're everywhere. On every street corner. There's churches, there's people jumping up and down for Jesus, you know, all over the place. But it, at the beginning, it was a big deal. Because remember, what did Jesus say? I've only come for who? The law sheep of the house of Israel. The Lord picked Paul, who was a rabbi, to preach the gospel. Well, he started with Peter, with uh, that vision he had of unclean animals. Of course, a lot of people interpret that, that Jesus was telling him he can eat pork now. That's a, somewhat of a misinterpretation of the Bible. Because Jesus would never tell you to do something he it says in the Torah not to do, but some people believe that, you know, enjoy your pork sandwich. What can I tell you? Um, he told them that because Jewish people were not allowed to even hang out with Gentiles. They were known as pagans. Jewish people who had God would not could not hang out with pagans. And how was a Jewish person going to speak to a pagan to give him the gospel if they stayed away from them? And Paul spoke to Peter in order for Peter to say that God said, what I call clean, don't say it's unclean. You can talk to the Gentiles. And he went and spoke to the Gentiles. And some Gentiles started to get saved. They're like, whoa, they got saved. They got the Holy Spirit without being circumcised, without keeping any laws, without doing nothing. It's not fair. We got to keep the Torah. We got to circumcise our children. We got 613 commandments. These upstarts come in. They call on the name of Jesus. They get saved. That ain't right. They got to be circumcised. I mean, they got to feel some pain. Ain't no free ride here. They got to feel some Jewish pain, Jewish guilt. They had a real problem. These people are getting saved, not even circumcised, eating pork sandwiches. They're not even keeping kosher. The Jewish people are going, what's up? What's up? What's up, God? So what they should have done was, everybody's getting saved without the Torah. Let's all throw the Torah out the window, right? If these dudes are getting saved without the Torah, let's get rid of the Torah, right? That's what I would have said. It's like, But that's not what they said. There's a real situation here. Let, can you read? Can you read about it? Or you don't want to know? Because a lot of people say, why is Easter a week later than Passover? It shouldn't be, right? Because it's all one God, isn't it? So God made up two calendars. There's two ways of, of there's the Jesus, there's the Jesus, there's Yeshua, there's the Jewish way, there's the non-Jewish way. I mean, is, can the real Jesus please stand up? So they caused great joy to all the brethren, verse 3, because they were declaring the conversion of the Gentiles. And they were come to Jerusalem, verse 4. They were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But, verse 5, there rose up a certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed. The Bible says even there were some Pharisees that believed. I mean, people say Pharisees didn't believe. There were some Pharisees that believed. You see it right here, right? Are you making stuff up? Are we reading the same Bible? 
Tessa, are you checking on if they don't mind making fun of Job? It says that. There were Pharisees. I thought the Pharisees were all just against Jesus. No, there were some Pharisees that were believers. But they were, what's a Pharisee? Somebody who kept the law of God. Taught people how to keep the Torah. So what do you think somebody who kept the Torah, who kept the commandments of God, is going to say? What's a person that keeps the commandments of God going to say? You need to circumcise them and, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. What else is a Pharisee going to say? I mean, that's the way he was trained. Paul was a Pharisee. He said, as touching the law, he said, I'm blameless. But he said, I, 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 I'm discounting all that. There, there's a different way now to do things. But not to throw the law out the window. Because had they really had, if they, were to, if they understood about being Jews, being together with non-Jews, that wasn't allowed back then, by the way. Gentiles were not allowed in the temple area even. The outer court, right? And most of these, if you go to an Orthodox synagogue today and you're not Jewish and you walk in and you say you want to be Jewish, they'll kick you out. They'll tell you, what are you doing here? You're not Jewish. This is not for you. You've got to beg them to be Jewish. I want to convert. And they will circumcise you. It reminds me of a story the first time we went to Israel. What was it, like 2004? The first time we went? 2002? We went to Israel. Um, her mother cried, said we were never coming back. We were going to die in Israel. I said, well, the Lord told us to go to Israel. We go to Israel. We get a, an Israeli guide. You get a professional guide to take you around Israel. He was from Chile, Chileno. He was from Latin America, a Jew from Latin America who had done Aliyah, who had gone to live in Israel, spoke Hebrew, spoke Spanish. He was the ex-ambassador to Mexico. So, I mean, we had a big shot to lead us around. The ex-ambassador to Mexico from Israel. And we start talking to them. We're Jewish believers in Yeshua. We tell them we keep the Torah. I mean, we're doing things the way they did in the first century. And he was like... He goes, you know, he says, I'm really happy with you guys. I said, why? He says, because every church group that I lead, they all try to convince me to accept Jesus and get baptized. And he says, you know what I do? And I tell those pastors, I said, no, what do you do? He says, I tell them that I'm willing to be baptized if they're willing to be circumcised. <laughs> he said he hasn't gotten one offer. You see the difference? between Jewish people and non-Jewish people, that's what was going on here. It's still going on today. I mean, if you come to a Messianic congregation and you're not Jewish, and you decide you're going to follow the God of Israel, and you're going to do it in the Jewish way, you will be, I mean, you're going to be criticized. You're going to be maligned. I mean, they're going to say all kinds of manner of evil against you. If it hasn't already happened, the chances of you not being Jewish and being in a Messianic country, you've got to have a strong backbone and you've got to have a thick skin because most of your church friends will disown you. See, it's, since we're in the 21st century and we're discussing first century, see, this is first century. The, all the believers were Jews that kept the Torah. A few Gentiles show up and they're like, hey, guys, you've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the Torah. You've got to keep the law of Moses. They were in control. Now the Gentiles are in control because there's more Gentiles than Jews that are believers. We're outnumbered now. But we weren't outnumbered then. We got to call the shots. Jewish believers of Jesus, including Pharisees, called the shots. That's why it's called the Jerusalem Council because the apostles and elders were all Jews, Torah-observant Jews. Are you with me? That's what's going on. Because a lot of people say, like, what's going on? People still ask me, you keep Christmas, you keep Easter? And I tell them, no. Because if you believe in Christ, you've got to do these things. No, not if you're Jewish. Not if you want to follow him the way the first century believers did. Are you with me? I don't know if you guys can handle this. I don't know if you can handle the truth. A lot of people like to keep their head in the sand. 
And verse 6 says, The apostles and elders came together for to consider of this matter. And when there had been much disputing, it was a big argument. It was not a simple thing. This was a hard thing to consider. There was much arguing. There was much disputing, it says, right? Peter rose up and said to them, Men, brothers, you know how that God, a, a, a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord, Yeshua, Jesus, Christ, the Messiah, we shall be saved even as they. That's pretty good, Peter. I like that. So, Peter, let's get rid of the Torah. Let's go to Sunday worship. Let's do Easter eggs. Come on, Peter. You just said will be saved the same. Then all the multitude kept silent and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. And after they had said their peace, James answered, saying, Men, brothers, listen to me, hearken to me. Simeon, or Peter, has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this agree the words of the prophets, as it is written. After this, I will return, I will build again the tabernacle of David. That was the prophecy which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof. I'll set it up, Amos 9, 11, that the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord who does all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Verse 19, what does James said? Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which are from among the Gentiles that have turned to God, but that we write to them that they abstain from pollution of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. For Moses of old time has in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabas and Silas, chief men among the brethren, and they wrote letters by them after this manner. What did the letters say? Verse 23. <coughs> the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting to the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you, with words subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the Torah and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandments. Now notice what the apostles and elders did with the non-Jewish believers who had gotten saved and received the Holy Spirit. What did they tell them? You do not have to circumcise and you do not have to keep the law of Moses. Oh, Rabbi Gabe, what happened to the Torah? To the church, there it is. What happened to the Torah? They said not to keep it. They said not to keep it. You can't blame the Pope. By the time the Popes came around, it was 300 years later. And 325 A.D. in the Nicene Council, they just continued to do what was said in the first century. They said, no, nothing of the Jewish part shall continue in the Roman Catholic Church. As a matter of fact, if you kept Shabbat, you would die. It was penalty of death. By the time the Romans declared Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, the Torah was long gone. The Jewish roots were long gone. And I'm here to tell you that even the Protestants that moved away from the Catholic Church, they still, I mean, most Protestants today are watered-down Catholics, as far as I'm concerned they still keep many of the traditions and things that the church did. Now, can we blame the Catholic Church? Absolutely not. Who's responsible for this? The Jerusalem Council was responsible for this. But no, Rabbi Gabe, they had the synagogue. You could go to a synagogue and listen to Moses. 
Come on, man. As a Gentile, you were not allowed in the synagogues. As soon as they smelled you were a Gentile, you were, you were quickly escorted out the door. Gentiles couldn't show up. I mean, you'd have to sneak in with a beard and a yarmulke. That was not the case. They were basically telling them they didn't have to circumcise and they didn't have to keep the Torah. Why would they say that? Because they got the Holy Spirit and got saved without all that stuff. So two and two makes four, and they realize, hey, they got saved without anything. Let's keep it going, guys. You don't need to keep anything. Now, what they should have done was to drop the Torah, the Jewish believers. But they didn't. The Jewish followers of Jesus continued keeping the commandments of God and circumcising their children. Interesting, because they were no longer together now. And what does the Bible say? A house divided shall not stand. The church today is void of its Jewish roots. Even though the Lord in John 4 said salvation is of the Jews. I mean, it was, it was the Christ, the Messiah, came to the Jewish people. He said, I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He, he picked a Pharisee named Saul, Paul, to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. That's who he sent. But they told Paul not to teach the Torah to the Gentiles, not to teach the law of God. So today we come to the church and say, we don't have to keep the law. And we're like, we're Jewish believers. We're going to keep the law. You don't have a justification. Well, you have a justification if you're not Jewish to not keep the law because they said it was okay. I'm justified to keep the law if I want to because they kept it. So now we get a Messianic congregation. We put Jews and Gentiles together and we're like, Jews, we're going this way, and Gentiles go that way. Huh? It's not working too good. The Gentiles feel left out. They come to the Mishkan, they're like, we want to keep the Torah too. We're like, hey guys, read Acts 15, buddy. You don't have to keep the law. You don't. That's what they said. Well, we don't like that. Can we worship with you guys? Can we keep the Torah? Um... Not recommended, but, I mean, that's how this congregation was for a few years at the beginning. When a lady knocked on my office door, she said, I have a word for you. I said, oh, no. I hate when people say that. I have a word from the Lord for you. I'm like, what? She goes, God told me to tell you that this congregation is not going to grow uh, divided this way because you're telling Jews to keep the Torah and you're telling non-Jews not to keep the Torah. And it's not going to go anywhere like this. I'm like, that's the way it is. That's how it's written. We're doing what the Bible says. Well, God doesn't want that anymore. Well, what does he want? He wants you to do things together. Together? We've never been together. Agree? We've never agreed. Uh, my people said you got to be circumcised and you got to keep the Torah. And they said they didn't, they didn't need to do that. That's how it's been. We've never been... Jews have never been, Jewish believers have never really been together with non-Jewish believers. This hasn't happened. Now all of a sudden, the 21st century, the 20th century, God starts saving Jews, puts them in Messianic congregations, and puts the Torah in our heart. And we're like, hey, I love this Torah business. Because Yeshua, Jesus, fulfilled all these things. I see him in all of the scriptures. My eyes are open. The veil's been removed, the Bible says, because my heart turned to Christ, turned to the Messiah. The veil's removed. I read in the Torah and the writings of Moses everything about Yeshua. I love it. He's the Messiah promised to our people. It's so exciting. And I see all of the details of the things that he, that he fulfilled. I'm excited, but not for you, Junior. You can't have this. This is mine. Stop wearing that tallit and start it. As a matter of fact, there are Messianic Jewish organizations today that if you can't prove you're at least a quarter Jewish, I think, you cannot be a voting member. That's why we dropped out of the alliance. Because I looked at my card one day and it said associate member. And I said, I called them up. I said, what does associate member mean? 
And the lady who answered the phone said, you're not Jewish. I said, well, you should tell that to my mother and my father and my grandparents because they were all Jews. Who said I'm not Jewish? Somebody said you are Jewish. Did you ask me? I'm more Jewish than the people that started this organization because their mother wasn't Jewish, and according to the rabbis, they're not even Jews. My mother was Jewish. My grandmother was Jewish. My great-grandmother was Jewish. I ain't a quarter Jew. I'm a full pedigree. And after what God put in my heart, I can no longer belong to an organization that doesn't do things together. I cannot be in, a, in, a, in an organization or a group that cannot agree on doing things together. Either we throw the Torah out the window and do it the Gentile Jesus way or we do it the Jewish Jesus way. I found out, because I've been on both sides of this fence, by the way, because when I got saved, they told me the same thing, forget the Torah, and I believed them. I did things without the Torah. You know how far I got in the kingdom of God? Not very far. I stayed sick. I stayed depressed. I didn't do things, God, I didn't do things God's way. Because I didn't want to keep the Torah the way that Orthodox Jews keep the Torah. Because I didn't realize that if you keep the Torah the way the master kept the Torah, you're cooking with gas. And they should have made that decision back then, but they didn't. Is it accurate? Of course it's accurate. That's what's happened. That's what happened. But is, are we to accept this in the 21st century? That's my question. Could God say, I want you to be together? And I want either you were going to keep the Torah as Jews and Gentiles together, not the way Judaism keeps the Torah, because most of Judaism today is rejecting Christ. They're Christ rejectors. They don't keep the Torah the way the Messiah kept the Torah. But if you keep the Torah, they immediately say you're a Judaizer, you're religious, you're crazy. They have a right to say that because they haven't kept it in 2,000 years. But we have a right to question it just like they did. We have a right to question everything. And questioning and asking questions is good. So, for as much as we have heard, verse 24, that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of the Lord, Yeshua. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas, who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. Verse 29, that you abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Bye-bye. Fare ye well. Who told the Gentiles not to keep the Torah? The Pope? What's, a, what's written? Who told the Gentiles not to keep the Torah and be circumcised? According to Acts 15. Oh no, Rabbi Gabe. They told them to go to the synagogue, sneak in through the back door and listen to the Torah. No, they didn't. Acts 21. I've heard that before. That's a lame excuse. Oh, they told the Gentiles that just to get them started. That's a lame excuse. That's not the truth. Acts 21, are we still in the Bible? Verse 17, let's start there. Acts 21, 17. Are you getting something here? We're trying to figure out, is it Passover or Easter? Will the real Jesus stand up? And we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly, and the day following Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when we had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said to him, You see, brother, verse 20, here it comes, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, Jewish believers, Thousands of them, when? The first century. Are you with me? And they are all zealous of what? They are zealous of the law of Moses. 
They are zealous of the Torah. Jewish believers and Jesus were zealous for the Torah. So I have justification as a Jewish believer to be zealous for the law. Whether you like it or not, it is written. I have biblical standing. Notice again what it says. So don't come out of your church and tell me I cannot keep the Torah. I want you to come out of your church and keep the Torah with me is what I want you to do. I want you to leave your pagan roots and I want you to see what you've been robbed of as a non-Jewish believer for the last 2,000 years because you've been robbed. We were robbed. Most Jewish people were robbed because they told us Jesus wasn't the Messiah. You know how many Jewish people have been robbed? Most of them. For a Jew to accept Jesus today, I mean, you got, you might as well put a rope around your neck. But you got the same problem. For a Gentile to come out of the church and accept the Torah, the Jewish roots of the faith, you might as well put a rope around your neck. We might as well have a rope hanging on the door here. We're all traitors. I'm a traitor to the Jewish people, and you're a traitor to the Gentiles. Because I've accepted Jesus, and you've accepted Moses. You have as much trouble accepting Moses in your life as I have of, of Jesus. So if you can't handle rejection, Messianic Judaism is not for you. Because you will be rejected. You will be maligned. They will say all manner of evil against you falsely because the real Jesus of the Bible worshipped as a Jew lived as a Jew was circumcised on the eighth day which lines up with the Feast of Tabernacles died on Passover rose from the dead on first fruits which is in the Torah first fruits is on Sunday I mean it's amazing all the things he fulfilled as a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 5, he said, don't even think that I've come to destroy the Torah, the law, or the prophets. I have come to fulfill. And he said, Father, whoever teaches to break the least of these commandments and shall teach men so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. I don't want to be the least in the kingdom of heaven. I want to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And to be great in the kingdom of heaven, you have to teach the commandments of God and you have, you have to keep the commandments of God, and you've got to teach other people to keep the commandments of God. And guess what happens when you do that? Revelation 12, 17. Hello! So whether you're Jewish and keep the Torah and have the testimony of Jesus, or whether you're a Gentile and keep the Torah and have the testimony of Jesus, guess who's going to make war with you? Those of your own household will become your enemies. Your mother, your father, your uncle, your aunt will become your enemy. Why is Satan making war with these people? Because he knows when you keep the commandments of God and you have the testimony of Yeshua, you're cooking with gas. Your life will be restored. Your life will be glorified. Because the Bible doesn't say religion became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. It says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. If you put in yourself some Jewish tradition junk or some Christian tradition junk, you got junk. You're a junkie believer. You're a junkie. But if you put the commandments of God inside you, and the word of God inside, and you let him write. Just like he wrote on the tablets of stone under the first covenant. Did he write with his finger on, on the tablets? So if he can write on stone his commandments, could he write them on your heart? Oh, blasphemy. God can do stuff? That's how, he, that's how the new covenant works? Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. I'm a new covenant believer. Great. Read these four verses. You'll get it. 
Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a... Oh, the Jews will never have a new covenant. <laughs> Jeremiah was a Jewish prophet 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Of course God said he was going to make a new covenant, you silly rabbit. I will make a new covenant. With who? With the Gentiles? He didn't say that. He said with the house of Israel. Jesus said, I've only come. As a matter of fact, the Samaritan woman said, you're a Jew. What are you doing talking to me in John 4? And he said, woman, believe me, the hour has come. Now is when the true worshipers shall worship in spirit and truth. How does this new covenant work? I will make a new covenant, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. I'll make a new covenant so they can keep breaking. What happens when you break God's commandments? Isn't that sin? Well, brother, I'm under grace. God forgives my sin. Okay, I believe that. God forgives your sin. Now show me in the Bible where it says he will bless your sin. Aha. Uh -huh. I'm saved. Oh, I'm glad you're saved. You ain't blessed, though, unless you keep the commandments of God. I like being saved. I like being saved for a while until I said, God, can you bless me? I'm happy with my salvation, but I'd like to see some blessings. Does he bless sin? No. So what do you got to do to get blessed? You got to do what God says. Who shows up when you do what God says? The devil shows up. Why is the devil showing up and making war with me? Because the devil knows when you do what God says, you get blessed. And he only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Oh, he's stolen quite a bit. I said it earlier. What did he steal? He stole Christ. He stole the Messiah from the Jews. Most Jews say, that no, Jesus. And he stole Moses from you Gentiles. Ha, ha, ha. We're in the same boat. We've both been robbed. What shall we do? Calling Dick Tracy. God, what shall we do? We've been robbed. Well, let me bring some Jews that accept Jesus as their Savior, the Messiah. And let me bring some Gentiles over here that have been robbed of the Torah. Let's put them together in the 21st century let me see if we can put back everything that they've both been robbed and see if it works better. Oh, there's going to be a war over this. There's going to be a big war. There's going to be Jews maligning you. There's going to be Christians. I'm surprised we don't get Christian haters outside. Parading. Judaizers. Oh, we've been accused of everything. Because the devil is so mad. Because when you put the whole thing together, the way the Lord put the whole thing together, you get blessed. And the devil's at the door trying to stop us because he knows how this works. Oh, Rabbi Gabe, I love the Mishkan. I said, get ready for a war. I'll see you next week. Haven't seen them in months. What happened? My in-laws came over. I got sick. Uh, my car died. Uh, my battery died. My car got repoed. My wife threw me out. I... Oh, so when you try to go to the Mishkan and get back everything that was stolen from us, the devil was still working on you. He didn't want you to show up because this is where everything's put back together. It's not easy. You gotta have a thick skin. Oh, I met many people. Oh, Rabbi Gabe, I got your back. Why well, they promptly stab a knife in my back. If every knife wound I had on my back from my brothers that said, I have your back, if they were sticking out, I'd look like a porcupine. I've been maligned, I've been lied to, I've been cheated. The Lord said, bless them. I bless all you cheaters. I bless all you thieves. I bless all you that told me you're going to pay me back and lied. I bless the users and the abusers, the thieves and the liars that have come in here that pretend to be believers. 
But if you want the real thing and you want the devil not to rob you anymore, you got to come out of your synagogue and you got to come out of your church to places like this. And you got to put the whole thing together against their will. Because their will is to divide us. God's will is to put us together in the last days. Now, if you understand that, you'll understand this place. So, are you with me? I see some shocked faces. We probably, we'll probably get thrown off Facebook for this. Blasphemy! He's crazy. Oh, yeah, I'm crazy like uh, Yeshua was crazy. So they, when they heard this, they glorified the Lord, verse 20. Where were we? Acts 21. Do we have an extra couple minutes? Because like Esther wouldn't stop singing tonight. It was annoying. No, she, she did great. I remember we had a praise and worship leader. He would never stop. He was annoying. <laughs> wouldn't, let me, wouldn't let me speak. I guess he didn't like what I had to say. The devil doesn't like this kind of talk, by the way. But maybe you can handle the truth. A lot of people can't handle the truth. But I like the truth. The truth sets you free. So, they glorified the Lord, said, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they're all zealous of the Torah or of the law, verse 20. And they were all informed of you that you teach all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that you are come. Do therefore this that we say to you. We have four men which have a vow on them. Then take, purify yourself with them, and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads, and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. They were talking to Paul, a Jewish believer in Jesus. That you walk orderly, Paul, because you're Jewish and you keep the Torah. But we gave no such commandment to the Gentiles. As touching the Gentiles, verse 25, which believe, we have written and concluded that they do, that they observe no such thing. No Torah for the Gentiles. Somebody say, we were robbed. You were robbed. We were robbed. We were lied to that Jesus wasn't the Messiah. You were robbed not to keep the commandments of God. We're in the same boat. Like I said, if you would like to, what's the word I want to use? Repossess, restore. If you would like to be restored, if you would like to restore in your life what the devil has stolen from the Jews and what the devil has stolen from the Gentiles, you've come to the right place. But the Bible says it's a war to come to a place like this because there are millions of Gentiles that are going to tell you, worship on Sunday and keep Good Friday and don't eat meat on Friday and keep Easter bunnies. And we're going to say we're doing Passover because he died on Passover and he rose on first fruits according to the scripture and we're counting the Omer which is seven weeks, 49 days plus one which is Pentecost when he gave the Holy Spirit. Because he gave the Holy Spirit on Pentecost which was 50 days from Passover in case you didn't know that. The word Pentecost means 50. It's in the Torah. And you know what else God did on Pentecost? He gave the Torah on Pentecost when they came out of Egypt. If you calculate about 40 days that Moses was up, remember, he passed it? When do you think he gave the Torah? On Pentecost. And he gave the Holy Spirit on Pentecost so that we don't put it together. <laughs> Ouch. So that one replaces the other? One rejects the other, the one that we reject each other. Oh, no Holy Spirit, no Christ, no Messiah. Oh, no Moses. Let's try that for 2,000 years and see how it works. It's working wonderful. Bra miracles are breaking out all over Orthodox Judaism, and miracles are breaking out all over Catholicism. Baloney, nothing's happening. He's not going to glorify 
man's commandments. He's not going to glorify our traditions. He's going to glorify his words. That's when miracles break out. That's when the Holy Spirit shows up. That's when you get healed. That's when you get restored. That's when you see people getting healed and restored in their lives. When you got the whole enchilada. Somebody hold up their Bible if you have one. Is the Torah in your Bible? Are the prophets in your Bible? Is the new covenant here? Though it's, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have to buy a new book to come here. It's the same book. And in God's wisdom, he kept it all together. Look, 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 look. Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. We gave no such commandment. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood and from strangling for fornication. Gentiles say goodbye to the Torah and Moses. Jewish, believe, Jewish people say goodbye to Christ. He's not yours. How are you doing, Jewish person, without Jesus? Not so good. How are you doing, Mr. Mr. Church or Mrs. Church? How are you doing without Moses? Not so good. How you guys doing with everything together? Hallelujah! It works like a champion. You're going to have to fight for it. Revelation 15. We'll close with this. To be continued tomorrow because it's almost 10 o'clock. It's past my bedtime. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. You mean corona was a plague? If corona is a plague, that means there's six more to go. If corona ain't, a, ain't one of the seven plagues, we got seven more to go. Not good news. I don't like this. Anybody like corona? I don't like it. Imagine if there's seven of these. Somebody say, we need to get it right in the last days. Funky things are going to happen. Scary things are going to happen. How many know scary things are happening? We might as well get it right. I want to get it right. I, want, I need full protection from God. I, want, I, I, I'm not, I mean, vaccines are nice, but they're, what do they say, 90%? I don't like that 10% business. Because when you don't have God, you'll end up with the 10% that you didn't want. I got a vaccine and I got the corona. Well, listen, it's only 90%. How many know God's 100%? I'd rather have 100% assurity. I'd rather get the victory in the last days because in the last days, you're going to need the victory. This, this wishy-washy Judaism and this wishy-washy Christianity ain't going to make it in the last days. It worked before because nothing major really happened. Only a couple of world wars. You know, all things still happen, and people were still divided. But, I mean, it's really going to it's, it's gonna get even uglier in the last days. And we're alive. We're in the 21st century. God might as well put everything back together for us, so we got something to hang on to. I mean, I'd be worried if I didn't have the whole story. Wouldn't you? Seeing what's going on. So they have the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Verse 2. And I saw there were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory. I saw a group of people that had gotten the victory. Somebody said, I want to get the victory. Over who? Over your mother-in-law? Over the beast. I mean, that's a huge victory if you can get a victory over the devil. I saw the group that got the victory over the beast, over the image, his image, over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass. They had harps. They were, they, were, they, were, they were playing instruments. Verse 3. And they sing. What are these people that got the victory? What are they singing? 
What are they so happy about? There's seven plagues happening. There's stuff happening around them. They're getting the victory. Who are these people? They sing. What are they singing? What are they singing? Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. No. Notice what these, these people are singing. They're singing who? The song of Moses, the servant of God. And they're singing about both sides. They got the whole enchilada. You ain't going to get in your synagogue. You ain't going to get in your church. Because the church singing about the lamb and the other place, they're singing about Moses. You got to come to a place like this to sing both. To put it both together. Because if you were Jewish, you were robbed of the Messiah. And if you weren't Jewish, you were robbed of the holy roots of the faith. This place is where you get unrobbed. Mishkan David, the unrobbed, where you get it all back, where we get it all back, and God puts it together, put us together, and we get the victory. And we're singing. What are we singing? We're singing Moses. We're singing the Song of the Lamb. And we're saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, thou King of the saints. Now we got something to sing about. Because if it's broken and it's missing, you ain't singing. I'm singing because I was broken and now I'm restored. I was missing, but now nothing's missing. I have shalom. Real shalom, not fake shalom. Real shalom, nothing broken, nothing missing. I have Shabbat shalom. I got something to shout about because if, it if it's broken it ain't, and it's missing, you got you ain't going to sing. You'll be sitting in the back door going, ooh, 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 ooh. I did that for the first two years. <laughs> My life stinks. That didn't get me anywhere. What got you somewhere? The sincere milk of the word. Like a baby. What did you do? I read the whole book for myself. And you know who I trust? The one who is the book that became flesh and dwelt among us. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. This is His words. And don't you dare chop this up. Because when you chop it up, it don't work. When you put it together the way he put it together, it works. Let's stand up and honor him, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It works. Works like a champ. Does it work? Is it working? Honey, is it working? Say it out loud. It's working. I give you a lot of money to say that. It works. Somebody say it works. Now, if you want to see it work, you're going to have a battle on your hands because he makes war. But those that are attempting to put it together, don't you put it together. You go to your church. I go to my synagogue. What are you people doing together? What are you? Are you Jewish? Are you not Jewish? Are you a Gentile? What have you become? I've become what he is. My Messiah. My King. My Lord. My Yeshua. My salvation. Abba in heaven, we cannot praise you enough. We can't thank you enough. Thank you, thank you, thank you for restoring what was stolen from the Jewish people what was stolen from the Gentiles. Thank you, Father in heaven, for restoration, for putting us together, for refusing to be divided, for refusing to be apart. Father God, you are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And thank you for this new covenant. 
Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you that you will write your laws the way you wrote them on tablets of stone. You will write them in our hearts and you will write them in our inward parts. And you will be our God and we shall be your people. Thank you, Lord, for making your house a house of prayer for all nations. Thank you for restoration. Thank you for restoring the Messiah to the Jewish people. Thank you, Lord, for restoring the holy roots, the Torah of the faith to the Gentiles. And we pray this in the name of every name, in the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, the name of Jesus, the Christ, in his name we pray, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a big hand. Or if you don't agree, don't give him a big hand. But Shabbat Shalom to you anyway. We sing a new song, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And as we dismiss the service tonight, just want to uh, uh, invite you to stay, break bread with one another, encourage each other to love and good works. As we say the bedtime Shema, we want to make sure, like I always say, that we, our heart is in the right place and uh, that there's no negativity in there of any kind, no resentment. Um, doesn't belong there. That's chametz. We're, we're, that's leavening. That's that's unclean. We don't want that in there. We want to keep our temples clean so that our prayers will not be hindered. So if you'll say it with me, um, we can uh, come in agreement in something wonderful and really fine before our Heavenly Father. So, sovereign of the universe, before I sleep, I forgive all who have angered me, upset, or sinned against my honor, body, work, or all that's mine. Whether willful, careless, accidental, purposeful, or through their speech, by word or by deed, in this world or other worlds, let no one be punished for my wrong. May it be your will I not sin again towards you, that I may not do wrong in your sight. May any wrongs I've done be erased in your great mercy, not through any punishment or pain. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable before you, my Redeemer and my Rock. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchut Ole Olam Vaed. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever. God bless you all. We're going to be here in the morning. I hope you'll join us. Shabbat Shalom. Laila Tov.